ladies and gentlemen. This is Anthony DeCurtis. You're on GetMusic.com, and we're here tonight for a very special event. The king of pop, one of the greatest artists in the history of popular music, Michael Jackson, is going to be joining us. He has a new record coming out on October 30th. It's called Invisible. You can check it out at MichaelJackson.com. You could pre-order it at GetMusic.com. Michael, it's a pleasure to talk to you, man. Pleasure to talk to you. Well, t- tell us a little bit about the new album. You know, it's your first new uh, you know, record in six years. Uh, do you still get excited when, when you have something come out? Obviously, you've accomplished so much over the years. You know, do you still feel that, like, wow, I wonder what people are going to think, or, you know, feel all of that kind of anticipation? I kind of parallel it to a, um, you know, it's like uh, the gestation process of uh, birth. Mm-hmm. You know, it's, uh, you know... It's like having uh, children, you know, and uh, having to raise them and bring them out into the world. And once they get into the world, they're on their own. So it's uh, it's very exciting. I mean, it's you never get too used to it ever. It's uh, it's an incredible process, you know. But you leave it in the hands of God, like you do when you're having a child. Absolutely. We've got uh, our questions are already beginning to pour in from your fans on the internet. We've got Electric Eyes Mail writing in. It says, Michael, you are in my mind the greatest artist of all time, the true king of pop, rock, and soul. And he wants to know, what is your favorite song on the new album? My favorite song on the new album. Can I pick two? Oh, uh, yeah, I think you could do that. You could pretty much do whatever you like. Uh, it would probably be... Unbreakable, I'll pick three. Unbreakable, <laughs> Speechless, and The Lost Children. Tell us, tell us about a couple of those uh, tracks. You know, what was it like working on? Were there, you know, special guests, or were you working with new producers, or you know, how you wrote them? You know, just something that uh, gives us some flavor. Well, the songwriting process is, is something that's very difficult to explain because it's very spiritual. It's, uh, you really just, in the hands of God, and it's as if it's been written already. That's the real truth. As if it's been written in its entirety before you were born, and you're just really the source through which the songs come, really, because they just fall right into your lap in its entirety. You don't have to do much uh, thinking about it. And I feel guilty having to put my name sometime on the songs that I I do write them, and I compose them, I write them, I... I do the scoring, I do the lyrics, I do the melodies, but still, it's uh, it's the work of God. Samantha from Canada just sent us in a question. She would like to know, how would you describe the sound on Invincible, and have you incorporated any other genres into the album? Well, the sound is, sonically, we always try to make sure we have, you know, pristine, detailed uh you know, the best sound, the best engineers, the best, te- best technicians available. And, of course, um, I tried to make the album a potpourri of just wonderful melodies of any style because I don't believe in stylizing or branding any type of music. I think a great artist should be able to just create any style, any form, any anything from rock to pop to folk to gospel to spiritual to just just wonderful music mm-hmm. where every uh anybody can sing it from the irish farmer to a lady who scrubbed toilets in harlem you know it's uh, if you can whistle it and hum it that's that's the most important thing now when you're working do you find are you in a, a mode where you like to listen to a lot of other music or you're listening to the radio or maybe picking up people's CDs or when you're working do you like to just kind of shut it all out and concentrate you know intently on what you're doing Well I pretty much I always know what's going on on the radio and in clubs what people are listening to even though people think I live at Neverland <laughs> I'm mentally I'm in Never Neverland all the time but <laughs> I'm always connected. I always know what's going on uh, in the music world all the time. Not just in America, but internationally. You know, all over the world. And uh, when I'm working, though, I don't... I'm not in... I don't think I'm influenced by a lot of the music today. 
uh, I pretty much create what I think is in my heart. Mm-hmm. It's very original. I try to be as original as possible. I don't say, okay, I'm going to make this a great kind of R&B song or a great pop song. I just want to make a great song. Like the song takes its own form. Yeah, yeah. Well, uh, Amber here on the Internet offers you lots of love and wonders if um, it was fun for you to make the rock, the, the, the You Rock My World video. Yes, that was a lot of fun. Uh, was, <laughs> we stayed up all night working very hard. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> we, um, it was fun hearing it blasted on the set on really big speakers. That's one of my favorite things. It's hearing the music really loud, because I like to play music loud. Mm-hmm. I mean, it's um, if you play something over, you know, the Internet or small speakers, it doesn't have the same punch. That's why you have to buy it. Uh-huh. You have to buy that CD to really hear that punch. It makes a huge difference, huge difference. There's no comparison. So buying the CD is, is, is the best thing, you know. No comparison. So, so you don't you... hear all the sounds if you hear it on a smaller system. And when you're, uh, so when you're out on the video set, uh, you're able to just kind of crank it up as loud as you want? As loud as I want. <laughs> Very good. Well, we have, um, Michael, uh, Matthew from Manitoba, Canada, uh, writing in. He says, I just saw a ghost on MTV. As always, you were awesome, Michael. Do you have any plans on releasing it as a DVD in America? Yes, it will be released as a DVD in America in its entirety and some of the making of Ghost, and that was one of, the, one of my most favorite things I've ever done because it's been a dream of mine for a long time to do something that's kind of scary but, you know, comical at the same time and uh, just all the elements of just fun because I don't want to scare people to the point where they're afraid to go to sleep. I wanted to have a little sense of humor, mm-hmm. you know, and within the laughter there is a tear, you know, so it's uh, just fun, you know. These ghosts... They weren't really scared. They were fun. They walked up the ceilings. They, <laughs> little kids were laughing at them. So it was fun. You know, we didn't want to horrify them. But we gave this fat man, this mayor, his justice for coming into my house, which was public, you know, private property, mm-hmm. private property, you know, judging me, you know? Absolutely. We have Cloud Lee 2000 who writes in and wonders, why did you name the album Invincible? Well, Invincible is something that uh, I think was the proper name. It's one of the cuts on the album. And I've been an artist, uh, not to pat myself on the back, but the Guinness Book of World Records just enlisted me uh, another time as as the artist who's had the longest stretch career since I've been a little, little kid to this point with still hit records and number one records. And uh, it's... Um, I'm so proud and honored that I've been chosen from the heavens or whatever it is to to be in, invincible and to just continue to grow and to to be you know serve the people to serve the people with wonderful entertainment. Now, one of the you know the kind of conventional wisdom these days in the music industry is you know audiences uh, don't really have an attention span anymore. You know, if an artist stays away for too long. You know, their audience wanders off and goes somewhere else. Was that a concern of yours uh, you know, with coming out in a record and taking a while to work on Invincible, or do you, uh, you know, are you convinced that you know, your fan base is still there and will be as strong as ever? I'm, I'm, you know, when you ask me this question, it has never concerned me once, and I've never thought of it, because I've always known if music is truly great or if a movie is truly great, people want to see it or hear it. Mm-hmm. No matter where you, how long, how long you've been away, or whatever the situation is, you know, greatness is greatness, and if you really do a good job on what you're doing, people want to hear it or they want to see it. You know, it doesn't matter. It really doesn't, as long as you're an innovator and a pioneer. You know, and uh, that's the most important thing. Give them what they want to hear. Now, Slim's Lady for twenty U.S sends in a question and wonders, which song on the Invincible album do you think you personally relate to the most? Um, Unbreakable. Talk a bit about that track. Now, you mentioned it a couple of times. I'm getting really curious about it. Can you? What could you tell us about it? 
because uh, I'm one of the few people probably in show business that have been through the ins and outs, you know, of so many different things. Um, I've been through hell and back. I have, to be honest, and uh, and still I'm able to do what I do, and uh, nothing can stop me. No one can stop me, no matter what. I stop when I'm ready to stop, you know, and uh, I'm just saying, you know. Now we have uh, Warful writes in, are you working or planning to do any more short films for Invincible, specifically for the really fast tracks, such as 2000 Watts, Heartbreaker, Unbreakable, and Invincible? Absolutely. And she said, whoever said that said the right word, and they said short film. Mm Mm-hmm. And uh, that's what we try to make them, short films, a a beginning, a middle, and an ending of a story. Uh, to take the medium to a new level, but absolutely, there's like a, just an array of uh, an encyclopedia of just great short films to uh, to make from the album. It's uh, very exciting. I can't wait to do Threatened, which mm. is a kind of scary one with Rod Serling from The Twilight Zone. Fantastic. You know, we, we that's I can't wait to get my hands on that one. We have a question here from uh, Napoleon Three. Uh, says his name is George, really, and then says, um, Michael, I think this is your most cohesive and impressive album since Thriller, or really off the wall. What are some of your most memorable moments while recording the tracks for this album? Most memorable moments were, it was, of all my albums, I would say this one was the toughest, because I was hardest on myself. Uh, I wrote so many songs, I don't even want to say the number. <laughs> just, just to get to, uh, how many are on there, 16? Just to get to the 16 that I that I think are acceptable. And um, and it's the album where um, I didn't have children before the, uh, the, uh, the other album, so mm-hmm. I caught a lot of colds, so I was sick a lot. Because my children said colds. Right, the little cold. incubators of viruses. Uh, so we had to stop and start again, stop and start, and it was a tough one. But um, I've enjoyed it very, very much. Now, when you describe yourself as being tough on yourself during the recording process, you know, how does that, you know, uh, what is the process that you go to? You know, if you think something isn't quite what it ought to be or maybe you could do better or you hear maybe you want to move something in a new direction, you know, what is what is that like? If I, was, if I truly told you, you, I don't know if the fans would like me anymore. <laughs> <laughs> I've had musicians who really get, angry with me because I'll make them do something literally several hundred to a thousand times Mm -hmm. until it's what I want it to be. Um, But then afterwards, they'll call me back on the phone and they'll apologize and they'll say, you were absolutely right. I've never played better. I've never done better work. I outdid myself, is what they'll say. And I said, that's the way it should be because you've immortalized yourself. This is here forever. It's a time capsule. It's like Michelangelo's work, you know. It's like uh, the Sistine Chapel. I fear forever, and everything we do should be that way, you know. So try to bring it to the best possible standard that it can be. Absolutely. Now, Sweet P forty two eighty six wonders: Are there any surprises on the new album? Any surprises? Boy, <laughs> I think it is what it is, and you can interpret it the way you want to interpret it. Um, but uh, that's all I can say about that. Other than some, um, maybe we'll be releasing some surprise CD singles at some point, something like that. Yeah, in the future, though, that's that's coming up. Very good. I wanted to ask you, just as a, a performer, you know, recently you've done a couple of shows. You did a couple at uh, Madison Square Garden, and you, uh, you did a show at RFK Stadium, a benefit concert. And, you know, obviously, you know, you Live performance has been one of the things that has distinguished you, you know, throughout your career. And you'd been off stage for a while. I wonder if you could talk a little bit about what it was like to be out there again in front of an audience and, you know, getting that opportunity to perform again. It was um, hard to explain. It was quite exciting to feel the audience and to see them and to be accepted so warmly by them. Um it's just an incredible feeling. It really is. If they're, they're there to support you and to love you and to hear their favorite songs and 
just stand there and they're just, you know, giving you so much adulation and love and hysteria. It's just full of love. It's wonderful. It, it's very emotional. You know, it it, uh, it brings me to tears. It's wonderful. I remember in your book you described that, like, sometimes on stage is when you feel the most alive, that those are the moments that, you know, really are the oh, kind of the most transporting for you. It is. Just being off stage is difficult for me. Uh, being on stage, either writing music or writing poetry and being on stage and watching cartoons are my favorite things to do in the entire world. Uh-huh. Um, um, that's what brings me to life. I love that. That's what inspires me to do what I do, you know? Excellent. We have a question here from someone's calling himself the best dancer in the world. Well, we got you on the line. I'm not sure that uh, we might have to contest that a little bit. But anyway, the best dancer in the world wants to know. Uh, Michael MichaelJackson.com said that Jay Z will appear with you on the new album. Is that true? No, but we are talking about doing something in the future together. Is Jay Z an artist whose work uh, you've liked, as, uh, or as a person? Have you, you know, spent time with him? What, what What's your impressions of him? I think he's excellent. He's incredible rhythms, counter rhythms, and he's just one of the newer contemporary artists that the kids really love. He's really, really great. We have a question here from Sweden. Tony from Sweden uh, writes in, says, "Hi, Michael. You're the most amazing artist of all times. I just love your music." Do you want to tour, and will you do a world tour or a European tour? Um, gee, uh, we haven't thought about it much right now, but um, I don't want to say it's not in the works. Um, we're concentrating on a lot of different things right now, so I can't quite say. Fine. I wanted to ask you. You know what? In the near future, I'm sure there will be something that will come up. Future. People should uh, keep their eyes open for uh, announcements on that front. Okay. Um, we have a question from Nuria. Describes uh, uh, him or herself as a 32-year-old Spanish fan writing from Los Angeles. Would like to know if you have any plans to release any of your songs in Invincible in Spanish or any other language besides English. Mm, uh as of now, we haven't, but that would be a great thing to do. We haven't written that off because it's a big market. So that's a great possibility. Especially for someone like yourself who has a you know, big international following. You know, for, for many people, their you know, following is you know, in England or in the U.S., but you know, your, your following is, is very international, obviously. Thank you. Um, talk a bit. One of the things that was... Uh, you know, kind of a little bit of a sensation this year was Alien Ant Farm's cover of Smooth Criminal. I wanted to see if you'd paid attention to it, if you uh, do you enjoyed it or how you felt about it. I saw it and fell in love with it. Excellent. I loved it. I, I said, I, I just got to have this come out. So they wanted my permission. I saw it and I approved it, gave it a triple A, said go right ahead. Fantastic. It must be interesting as a songwriter, you know, to have other people, you know, do your songs and come up with another interpretation. You know, what is, what is that like? It's a great compliment. It's a wonderful compliment. It makes you feel worthy and that your music is reaching all the different generations, you know, and all the different, uh, I mean, everybody's out there listening, you know, and that, uh, that makes me very happy. Now, we have a question from Canada. Uh, Gary, who is 19, writes in, What other artists did you collaborate with on, the, on Invincible? What other artists did I collaborate with on Invincible? Let me see. Who is there? Do you have any special guests? Mm -hmm. We have Carlos Santana. Is, uh, uh He and I have uh, done like a duet, and he uh, plays the guitar, and I sing. And it's something that uh, we've written. And it's really, really a nice song. Now, had you known him from, uh, you know, over time, or just uh, did you meet him recently? I've met him before, but uh, we've been talking a lot on the phone recently. So after winning his Grammy Awards, he said to the press that he would like to meet me and he's ready to work with me. So everybody's been telling me that, and... Uh, 
I called him up and he said he, he really would, that would be his dream come true. And he is the nicest man. He is so kind and so spiritual. I found him to be so humble, so I said to myself, we have to make this work. And so you you were, you wrote a song together? Well, there's a song that myself and two other people wrote, and he was a part of it. And... Uh, Whatever happens. Oh, okay. We have um, a question from Anicia. It says, Michael, are you a fan of Chris Tucker? She describes her being in your uh, your recent video. I'm a huge, huge fan of Chris Tucker. He makes me laugh so hard. Um, I, uh, I've seen all of his films, and he's just a funny guy. And I like people who can make you laugh without using vulgarity mm-hmm. or bad words. It's just in you know, for the kids, they're for all demographics. All the corners of the earth. We have another question from Canada. Tony, who's seventeen from Canada, writes uh and wonders how long does it take you to produce a song from the initial conception to the final recording and editing phase? Well <laughs> <laughs> I guess it probably varies from from It does it does vary and for me, it's really different than most artists because I'll I'll do I'll do a couple of songs. It could be five, six, seven, or eight, or ten of them, and throw them all away and start over. So that's a difficult question to ask me. I wonder if is there a specific, maybe a specific song on the album, say Invincible. You know, how long? You know, when do you remember like getting the first inspiration for that song, and then maybe the day when you finally said, you know what, this is it. I've got it exactly the way I want it. Song Invincible itself. Mm-hmm. Um. Yes. Yes. Uh, I remember having the guys go back in and create more innovative. Because we don't, uh, this is our thing, we don't uh, put a lot of sounds on the album that are sounds from keyboards uh, that are, uh, you know, pretty much programmed into the machine. Mm -hmm. Go out and make our own sound. Mm -hmm. Hit on things, we beat on things. (laughs) So nobody can duplicate what we do. We make them with our own hands. With, with, we find things and we create things, and uh, that's the most important thing to me, to be a pioneer, be an innovator. Absolutely. Now, we have Verne, who uh, writes to us from Newark, Delaware, in the good old USA, and uh, Verne uh, says, I'm so pleased with the new album, but I was particularly touched by Speechless. What was your inspiration for this song? Useless was inspired to me by, um, I was, I spent a lot of time in the forest. I like to go into the forest and I like to climb trees. My favorite thing is to climb trees. Mm-hmm. I go all the way up to the top of a tree and I look down on the branches. Whenever I do that, it inspires me for music. And there are these two sweet little kids, a girl and a boy. And they're so innocent. They're the quintessential form of innocence. And just being in their presence. I felt completely speechless because I felt I was looking in the face of God whenever I saw them. Mm-hmm. And they inspired me to write speechless. Well, and that answer actually might uh, touch on this next uh, question which we have, which wonders, where do you look for inspiration when you write your songs? Does inspiration come from a variety of different places? Well, the best songs that are written write themselves. You don't ask for them. They just drop into your lap. Then there are those songs that, you know, you kind of uh, incubate, you know, you plant the seed, let the subconscious take its course, and within time you hope something comes, and most of the time it does. I don't believe in the concept of writer's block. That is a bad word. You create it when you say it. It's no such thing. Um, Like any painter or sculptor, they paint, they do their best work when they're in their 60s and their 70s. Fred Astaire did his best dancing when he was in his 70s. Mm-hmm. Angelo sculpted late into his 50s and 70s, doing brilliant, ingenious work. And But in the music business, some of these great artists have become stumped because they've self-abused themselves and they're young age so early with all these crazy things they drink and pills and things in, uh, 
That's just not good. Right. It's just not a good thing. I hate to say that to hurt anybody, but we should take care of our bodies a little more. No, I think a lot of people realize, you know, that they've damaged themselves. You know, many people have talked about it in recent years, you know. Yeah. We have a question from Alan here who uh, asks, if you think that uh, Rodney Jerkins and you have created a new sound for 2001. The song 2000 what? He says, uh, "Have do you feel that you and Rodney Jerkins, of course the producer, have um, uh, created a new sound for 2001? 2001? Yes. Oh, um, that would be a nice thought, yes. <laughs> what was it like working with him? How did how did you guys meet, and, and, you know, how did your collaboration go? He was this guy who went around Hollywood and around the industry saying his dream was to work with me, to everybody. <laughs> I was at Carol Bear Sager's house, who's this great songwriter, won several Academy Awards for her songwriting, and she said, there's a guy you should work with. His name is Rodney Jerkins. He's been crying to me, begging to meet you. I mean, why don't you pick up the phone and you say hi to him? And he came over that day and he said, please, my dream is to, to work with you. He said, just give me two weeks and I'll see what I can come up with. And uh, we ended up working together. Uh, what and uh, what were your impressions of him? Like, as you know, just somebody did. What did he bring? What did you feel that um, you know his contribution was? His contribution was he loves to create uh, in the same kind of way that I like to create. But I push Rodney. Mm-hmm. I push and push and push and push him <laughs> to create, uh, to innovate more, to pioneer more. He's a real musician. He is a real music, and he's very dedicated, and he's real loyal, and he just he has perseverance. I don't think I've seen perseverance like his than anyone, because you can push him and push him, and he and he doesn't get angry. He um he's just a great guy. He really is. That's a great compliment. And um and Teddy Riley is just uh, incredible. He he's innovative too. I love working with him. And you had worked with him in the past, of course. Yeah, he's one of my favorite. As a human being, he's one of my favorite people in the world. He's just a really sweet, kind guy. You know, and Rodney's very funny. You laugh all day when you're with him. He, <laughs> when he, he turns his music up in the studio and he starts dancing around the room, <laughs> Fantastic. it's funny. I'd like to remind everyone, you're on Get Music. We're here talking with Michael Jackson, whose new album, Invincible, is out on October 30th. You can check it out at michaeljackson.com. You can pre-order it on Get Music. Now, we have a question from uh, It's Jackson, who is really named Rachel from Connecticut. Wonders, do you have any new dance moves that you've invented while you were making your album? For the first time working on any album, I put a halt to dancing because I was uh, just so engrossed and so infatuated with what I was doing. Um, uh, I did something that was very unusual. But once the music started playing, of course, I started to dance. But um, uh, it's starting to now create itself. And uh, with the music playing, I'm coming up with some new things but that's coming in the future with the newer short films. They'll be seeing they'll be seeing all kind of new innovative things in movement that have never been seen before. We'll go places you know where we've never gone and danced before. Because all the hip hop things that are happening now are beginning to look like aerobics. Uh-huh. Uh huh. Is kind of getting annoying. <laughs> so. We have a question from uh, Simon. Who you know? You've obviously mentioned you know, uh, obvious all the people who have wanted to work with you. He wonders, Michael, who would you love to do a duet with, past or present? Uh, if it's past, it would be somebody like um, uh, I would say Sarah Vaughan or Nat King Cole. Present, Fantastic. I think uh, Whitney Houston is brilliant, and Barbara Streisand has a beautiful voice. You know, those kind of artists mm-hmm. that are just wonderful. What's your impression of some of the artists who have come on the scene just in recent years? You know, people like Britney Spears and Christina Aguilera, you know, young pop stars who are obviously hugely popular. You know, you obviously, you know, Britney participated in your show 
uh, at the garden. You know, what, what was your sense about her? I think for the new breed that are coming up, they're doing a very good job. And what impressed me more about any of these artists, like uh, Spears and Christina, they're so determined. Absolutely. I've heard about the way they work. They'll work on a dance step, I mean, like for months. And to, to get it right, you know, uh, they're just so determined. They, and I've met, I've met Brittany several times, and she was very sweet and humble. She came to my room. And we quietly talked for a couple of hours. And she was just uh, like... I imagine that someone like you would be an you know, kind of interesting and important resource for her, you know, as someone who was, you know, a star when you were so young. I mean, when, when, I don't think people necessarily understand what a kind of strange reality that is, you know, within all the acclaim and the fame and the excitement, you know, to be a kid and, and have all that attention focused on you must be kind of scary also. Uh, did you find it that way uh, in your own experience? Yeah, because wh wherever I go, um, I disguise myself now, but now I can't, especially, you know, what's going on in the world. So I don't wear a disguise, and and uh, people, they just go, they really go crazy. They're very happy to see you. Mm -hmm. As well as if they know you, and you have to respond back to them like you know them. Right. They feel they personally know you. They, my pictures are on their walls, you know, my music is playing in their house. So they, they grab you, and they snatch you, and they touch you, and they... So I just respond back with hugs and loves and kisses because I love I love I truly love my fans, truly truly from the heart. That's the real truth. I love them, and the ones who are um, like if we go to a certain country and they're outside and outside they're sleeping on the street and I, I throw them pillows and cover and everything and I I have my security guards buy them pizza so they can all eat and we get the candles and. You know, we really take care of them. They're very, very, very sweet and supportive. Sam, who is 20 years old and from Texas here in the U.S., wonders, will you release Butterflies as a single that's one of your best songs? Butterflies is uh, the single that's released now. It's the single now. Tom, so, um, thank you very much. Great. What other, you know, plans do you have, you know, when you... Uh, you know, as somebody who's been a kind of innovator, uh, you know, in terms of uh, making short films to accompany your songs, you know, do you conceptualize all that ahead of time, or you know, do you decide on a kind of step-by-step -step basis? You know, this is going to be the next single, and I want to make uh, you know a kind of visual statement to accompany it. You know, how does that all proceed? Are the short film itself? Yeah. Well, I let the song pretty much speak to me, and I get in a room. And I pretty much start making notes. Then I'll I'll speak to a uh, a writer like Stephen King and myself. We both, both of us wrote Ghost, mm -hmm. wrote them Ghost, and we just on the telephone started writing it, and uh, and let it create itself and go where it wants to go. But we try to do things that are very unusual, and it's it's, it's not an easy thing to do because you have to time it with the song. And you can't spend too much time, and the special effects can take five months sometimes Absolutely. to execute. So it's, it's, not, it's not a difficult <laughs> thing. And the record company is saying, come on, come on, come on, we have to go, we have to go. <laughs> so I understand. So we, we try to do the best we can in the amount of time that we can execute it in. We have a question now. Uh, Helen from Scotland says, if you could only perform one of your songs for the rest of your life, what would it be and why? Ooh, it would probably be, if I could pick more than one, if I could pick two or three. So, yeah, I think we can go that far. Feel the World, Speechless, um, but that's a difficult one. I think the, uh, hmm. Mm, you are my life. It sounds you went for the ones that are the the kind of the the biggest statements in a way. It seems to me. Yeah, because uh, it's important that they're very melodic and that they have a great important message that's kind of immortal that can relate to any time and space. You know. 
One of the things, actually, I wanted to ask you is, you know, we've, uh, you know, had these, you know, horrible uh, terrorist attacks here in, in New York City and, and in Washington, D.C. What is the role that you feel, you know, artists can play in the wake of something like that? You know, obviously you did that benefit show in Washington. You know, is there in music and, and uh, you know, can artists do something to, you know, help people, you know, get through with what for many of us has been a very difficult time? Yeah, you give... You give of yourself. You give of your talent, of your ability, the talent that was given you by the heavens. That's why we're here. To bring a sense of escapism in time of need. And uh, if you're a painter, you paint. If you're a sculpt, you sculpt. You know. If you're a if you're a writer, you write. If you're a songwriter, you give song. If you're a dancer, you give dance. You give people some love and some some bliss, some escapism, and to show that you truly care from the heart and be there for them. Not just from a distance, but show you truly care. You know, take the long mile mm-hmm. and, and be there for them. And that's what I did and many others who cared and helped. And it's an important thing. We have a question now from Chili Boy who wonders, uh, he always wanted to know, how do you come up with the dance move and how long does it take for you to, you know, put the choreography for a song together? I pretty much just get in a room and I start to dance and uh, I don't create the dance. The dance creates itself, really. So I'll do something and I'll look back at, I'll look back on tape and I'll go, wow, I didn't realize I had done that. You came out of the drums. You become, dancing is about interpretation. You become the accompaniment of the music. So when you become uh, the bass to Billie Jean, I mean, I couldn't help but do the step that I was doing when the song first starts because uh, that's what it told me to do. You know, if I turn around, spin, stop, move my legs aside, and then lift up the collar of my shirt, that's for that moment in the accompaniment. I remember watching that moment on television and just leaping out of my chair. It was so extraordinary. Uh, thank you very much. It was really one of the great, great moments. And it's all spontaneous movement. Nothing in that piece was on the... Uh, Billie Jean was planned, but the moonwalk. Everything else was just, you know, improvising, really. Now, we have a question from S.J. Champs, who wonders, uh, do you think you'll do another duet with Janet? I would love to. Uh, It just depends on the song and the time. When she's in one corner of the earth, I'm in another place. Uh, (laughs) It's very rare that our ships pass in the night. So it's uh, it's not easy to do because we're both very busy. But that would be very nice. I love working with her. She's a true, real professional and a wonderful sister. Excellent. Uh, we have uh, Sheik33, who wonders, who was your idol when you were a child? I always went nuts. For, I, mean, I could be asleep in Indiana at like five years old. I'd be asleep, and there'd be a late night, like one in the morning, some show on. I remember seeing my mother run to my room, wake up, wake up, James Brown is on, James Brown is on. Wow. And wake up, or Sammy Davis Jr. is playing, or Fred Astaire, they got a good Fred Astaire movie on. Gene Kelly's on right now. <laughs> you know, and I'd sit there with my eyes, just be, I'd be awestruck, just watching. So when videos came out, I had a collection. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I understand that you have a, an extraordinary collection of kind of old movies of, of all of the uh, performers that you like and old uh, music performances of the artists that you admire. You know, talk about you know talk about some of those and, and some of the some of the stuff that you've got that uh, that you like to watch. Well, I, I like to um, before I do anything, it could be uh, any situation. I love studying the whole history of it before I take the first step to innovate. So um, I love studying any vaudevillian, you know, who came from that era, even though they didn't have TV. Sure. Uh, but they uh, they transcended into uh, television later on. Uh, I love people like Jackie Gleason, Red Skelton. I'm crazy about the Three Stooges, uh, anything Walt Disney. And as far as performers, uh, I love Anthony Newley. You know, like I said, Jackie Wilson, James Brown. Fantastic. You know, they're incredible. <laughs> I mean, when James Brown was James Brown in the Famous Flames, he was so incredible. I would watch him and cry. I'd be crying as I'm watching him. I've never seen a person perform like that, ever. 
You know, it must have been extraordinary for you as, uh, you know, when you were young and, and making records and, and getting to meet some of your idols, you know, that that must have been such a powerful experience. Oh, it, was, it truly was. And to have them tell me that they they thought I was incredible in all my life, I thought they were like the best. It was the best compliment I could get. And no award could be given to me that could top that, you know. When Fred Astaire or Gene Kelly, who... I knew very well, or Frank Sinatra told me uh, they think I'm amazing and I have an amazing career ahead of me. As a child, they would tell me this because they were my neighbors. They lived by me. Mm -hmm. And uh, I felt very honored and happy to hear those kind of words from these legends. Yeah, that must have been. We have uh, M. Hagreis, uh, who is actually Marguerite from the Netherlands, a 26-year-old woman says, is it true that you'll star in Men in Black 2, and will you record a soundtrack for that film? Um, I don't think we're doing a soundtrack, but I did a, uh, a guest appearance, like a cameo for Men in Black uh, 2, and uh, we were expecting to do Part 3 as well. And it was a lot of fun and exciting. Um, and it's one of my favorite films of all time. I'm a big Men in Black fan. I love it very much. Now, I understand you're also doing The Nightmare of Edgar Allan Poe. Could you tell us a little bit about that? Yes, that one's coming up. It's about the great, prolific American writer, uh, Edgar Allan Poe. Kind of a scary guy himself, too. Yeah, he's very diabolical and <laughs> very dark, and but he was a genius. And his, but his own personal life is very interesting, and that's what it's about, you know, how he was, you know, what, what he had to go through to create such ingenious work. It's a, it's a great story. But, and by the way, make sure the fans know all tabloids should be out. Do not believe anything you read in a tabloid. It's garbage and it's junk. We should have a tabloid burning like a big mountain just set it afire. You heard it first here from Michael Jackson. Don't waste your time with it. It's stupid. Now we have Ratmaster J.A. Uh, writes in, who is actually Jason from Illinois. He says, Michael, you are, undou you are undoubtedly the greatest artist in the history of the world. How do you do the moonwalk? It's the coolest move I've ever seen. Gee, it's hard to explain on the phone, but <laughs> I, it's can't imagine how you I could. love blues and dancing. <laughs> it's like walking forward and backwards at the same time, but not just walking, but as if you're on a conveyor belt. And it's, uh, it's hard to explain. Uh, if he was in front of me, I could show him how to do it with my fingers or with my feet, but um, maybe he could see uh, at the end of the uh, uh, jam video where I'm trying to show Michael Jordan how to do it step by step. <laughs> That's the only time I think I showed it. Now, we have uh, Mark Deshark uh, who asks, uh, how do you do that lean on the video to Smooth Criminal? Oh, Smooth Criminal. <laughs> well, um... That one happened, it was in the middle of the shoot, and it wasn't, uh, I choreographed it right at the moment. It took us an hour to execute it. Uh, it's a special effect that uh, we kind of lean as far as we can, and we uh, we uh, let the, the uh, conveyor belts do the, the rest, you know? Now, Glenn from Toronto, Canada uh, asks, do you feel a special spiritual energy when you're performing? Do you feel you are connected to a higher force? Because this is what you make many people feel when they see you live. That's exactly what it is. <clears throat> you're connected to a higher source, and you just go with the moment, and you become one with you know, the spirit. And not to sound religious or anything, but it's a very spiritual, very much like religion, and uh, it's, uh, it's a God-given gift. And you just go with it. And I'm honored to have been given it. And uh, it's fun to, to become one with the audience. It's, it's, a, it's a oneness, you know? I was reminded of uh, some of that when you were talking about, you know, the way you would work out your moves, you know, listening to, you know, just listening to the music and kind of disappearing into it. You know, it has that kind of, you know, really mystical feel. Thank you. Now, uh, Charlie sends in a question. It says, um, what achievement in your life are you the most proud of? Boy, uh, one of my biggest dreams since I was really, really little, I think around six 
or seven years old, I used to always buy the Guinness Book of World Records. Uh huh. <laughs> you know what the answer is going to be. <laughs> I said, hmm, I love to dance and sing. Uh, hopefully one day I could be in this book. I, I, and I believed that it was possible. So when Thriller became the biggest selling album of all time, and it was enlisted in the Guinness Book of World Records, and uh, there's so many other lists, you know, they've enlisted me in there like seven different times now. It was my the happiest time of my life. I was so happy. So what do you attribute, you know, that level of, you know, ambition and possibility that you felt when you were a kid? You know, I think it's sometimes hard for, for people to feel, you know, either, you know, you weren't obviously rich as a kid or, you know, from a, from a kind of fancy background, you know, but still somehow you, you were able to envision, you know, a life of success. You know, do, what do you attribute that to? I attribute that to my parents who always taught us to persevere, believe in yourself, have confidence no matter what you do. Even if you're sweeping floors or painting ceilings, do it better than anybody in the world, no matter what it is that you do. Be the best at it and have uh, respect for others and be proud of yourself and, and to honor, to be honorable, you know? Absolutely. Now, you've been making records for a long time. You've been a force on the music scene for many years. What do you think are the biggest changes in music that you've seen? Biggest changes? Yeah. What's changed about the music industry or about, you know, the music that's out there? What do you think is, is different? Well, I think, uh, I don't think people thought the rap music would last as long as it has. Mm-hmm. And it has, gone through evolution of stages, there's more melody in it now. And it's right. more acceptable because melody will never die. It will never die. And the rhythm, things are a little more rhythmic now because people want to dance. It's part of the human condition. It's part of our biological makeup. Our cells dance when we hear beats. Mm-hmm. So we notice a, a, a one-year-old child will start moving, hearing music. How do they know to move? Because it's biological. It's not just hearing of the ear. It's feeling. You know, and playing music, the grass and the trees and the flowers, they're all influenced by music. They become more beautiful and more vibrant in how they grow. Music is a very important and powerful substance. And all the planets in the universe make music. It's called music of the spheres. They all make a different note. They make harmony. So it's harmony even in the universe as we speak. Now we have a question from Holland. Uh, Femke from Holland writes and says, uh, I love the special editions from Off the Wall, Thriller, Bad and Dangerous. She loves you. And asks, uh, why does Invincible, why will Invincible be, be coming out in different colors? Because we wanted the fans to have some fun with it and collect them. And uh, it's the, uh, a limited edition, I think. And uh, there's albums that I, I love. And, and I will buy them five times, even though I have the same cover. Uh-huh. That's five times, because I love that album so much. So I imagine if they did a different color or just changed the cover, I would buy it five more times. <laughs> yeah. And we just wanted the fans to have some fun with the pictures and with the colors and just to try something a little different. That's why we did it. Now we have uh, TJ, who is 17 and from Australia, wants to tell you that uh, you are still my hero. It says, how do you explain your ability to inspire so many people all around the world? I just do what I do, and I love doing it. And uh, I love art. I love anything in the arts. And uh, if they're inspired by it, I feel like uh, I pray that I'm doing my job, what I'm here to do on earth. Because uh, I love the fans. I love the kids. I love the babies. And... uh, that's what gave me my inspiration, the children, the baby. Now, Michaela from Pennsylvania, who is 14, writes, uh, Michael, I'm only 14, but I've been a fan since I was 10. You've accomplished so much more than any artist ever. I was just wondering, if you could change one thing about your life, what would you change? I would like to be able to go out in public uh and just be normal sometime without people recognizing who I am 
just to get a little bit of uh, a feeling of what it's like to, you know, be of the regular norm, to see how things are done, to learn what people speak about when they're just casually talking. As soon as they see it's Michael Jackson, the conversation changes. It all becomes about me and not about the situation, the moment that's happening at the moment. Right. That that was I would learn a lot from that. I don't get to see that unless I disguise myself and put on a lot of things, and then they stare at me. Then it's even different. It's not the same even then. So it's a difficult thing to pull off. But tell him that's a very great question he asked. No, that's a really interesting question, actually. We have uh, an interesting answer as well. We have uh, Greg from Glasgow, Scotland, uh, wants to know, when do you plan to release the charity song, What More Can I Give? Well, it's being, uh, we're putting the final voices on, and uh, it's coming very, very soon. We're putting it together now, the final touches. This is a very important song for the world. We give some healing and some loving and some caring to those people who were thrust into orphanage uh, or just within a minute of seconds they lost their parents or their loved ones, you know? Absolutely. Um, what are some of the things you're looking forward to? What are your hopes for, you know, the new year? Uh, you know, we're, we're coming, you know, down to the end of the year. You know, you have an album coming out. We've, we've had a lot of uh, tragedies and crises that we've all faced. Everybody's trying to keep their spirit up. You know, what, when you start thinking about you know, 2002, what, what kind of things come to mind for you? Um, film, I love movies, to do more movies, to uh, integrate the songs with the films, um, dancing, uh, and more peace into the world. I pray for peace all the time. And the most important thing I pray for is the protection for children and babies. That's the thing that concerns me the most. I want them to be protected and to have more children's rights in the world or children, uh, you know, where there's a day for children, a celebration for children. Just to show more, give them a little more attention and love. Now, Sergey from Russia writes in, says, Michael, sing a cappella for us. <laughs> <laughs> you know what? I would love to do it, but believe it or not, I've been sniffling since this interview. <laughs> but I woke up with laryngitis. You can see that. I witnessed that. Uh, I caught a cold from the children uh, the other day. My children were sick, and I caught their cold. I tell her I'd love to do it when I visit their town in concert. And Speechless opens a cappella uh, on the album, the song Speechless. It's one of my favorites. So it opens with an a cappella part? It opens and closes a cappella. Now, we have a question here um, from Karen who says that uh, she's, that you've helped her since she was a little kid. You've always been one to think about other people, to care for children around the world. What could we do for you, she wonders. We give you all our love, but what more could we give to you? Obviously, one of your great fans here. When I come to town, I would love to see a children's festival, to hear children's choirs. Uh, you know, pretty much um, present when I come to different countries singing some of their favorite songs of mine. Uh, we should force and create a Children's Day, a celebration internationally where children are honored, where parents can take their children to the movies or to the toy store or to the park, and that alone will create a bonding because the family bond has been broken. They don't eat with their children or speak to their children much anymore or monitor their children. And I would love to see a celebration uh, for children, a Children's Day, a holiday. We have Mother's Day, Father's Day, no Children's Day. And uh, I would uh, love when I come to town to just to hear them sing songs you know, or a parade or something. I would love that. Now, Michael, we have one last question. It was a, a great pleasure talking with you. We have Emmanuel, uh, who is 16, from the United States. It says, Mr. Jackson, what would you say to all your fans that have dreams and goals of being a star like you? No matter what, the most powerful thing in the world is the human mind and prayer and belief in yourself 
and confidence and perseverance. No matter how many times you do it, you do it again until it's right. And always believe in yourself. And no matter who's around you that's being negative or thrusting neg negative energy at you, totally block it off. Because whatever you believe, you become. They say that, you know, the thing that most affects people or the way that you can really tell, you know, if someone's, you know, had a successful life is the way that they deal with success or the way that they deal with failure or challenges. It sounds like that's what you're saying. Yes, and after all of that, the most important, the most important, stay humble. The humbleness that a child like a newborn baby has. Even though you become powerful or, or have power with, with people, with your talent, or with, like, you know, with what Michelangelo did with sculpting, you know, underneath all that, be as humble as a child, as a baby, and as kind and giving and loving. Never become puffed up with pride. You know, I think we're going to sneak in one last question here from uh, someone called Invincible103. Now, Halloween is coming up. Do you have plans to uh, kind of dress up? Do you have plans for a Halloween party? Um, no. Um, I was going to just uh, go trick-or-treating, <laughs> <laughs> uh, knock on some doors and get some candy. Uh I love trick or treat. It's one of my favorite ones. I love uh, dressing up like uh, some kind of monster or something, and and knocking on the door because nobody knows it's me, and I get candy. So if Michael Jackson turns up at your door, people sure to be <laughs> nice. Have have some nice things on hand for him. Well, Michael, it was a great, great pleasure talking to you. A lot of fun, and uh, everybody wishes you the best with your uh, with the new record. We're all looking forward to it. Thank you so much, and God bless you. Thank you. Thank you very much. This is Anthony DeCurtis. That was Chat with Michael Jackson here on Get Music. If you want to check out Michael's new album, which will be coming out on October 30th, it's called Invincible, you can go to michaeljackson.com and hear it online to get a, a first taste of it. You can also pre-order it here on Get Music. I'm Anthony DeCurtis. This is Get Music.